So let me introduce uh, Dr. Yelmer Irkins, who is going to share his screen and um, get our uh, Biodiversity Museum Day Ask an Anthropologist series going. Take it away, Yelmer. Okay, <clears throat> hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an archeologist in the anthropology department. And so I'm going to talk, um, just do a quick, quick presentation about animal ecology in pre-contact period California. So in case um, you uh, don't know, what is archeology? span Well, uh, archeology, span the most common misperception about archeology span is that archeologists span dig dinosaurs. And I can assure you that um, I have never touched a dinosaur bone in my life, yet I'm still an archeologist. So what do archeologists study? Archeologists study people, uh, ancient people from long ago. So that means that we're commonly studying, looking at things like here, you see some pictures of some Egyptian hieroglyphs. These are things that archeologists study, pots, um, arrowheads, uh, ancient uh, villages. This is from uh, Mesa Verde in, in Colorado, these cliff dwellings. So these are the kinds of things that archeologists uh, study rather than dinosaurs. Um, and um, we are within the department of anthropology because we're interested in humans and human behavior, but we're studying those things in the past. So the other thing that you probably are familiar with about archeology span is that we dig, we do lots of um, excavations. And so here you see a picture of a pretty typical excavation. And so, you know, we find those arrowheads and we find broken bits of pottery. But another thing that we find lots of are bones, animal bones. So here you see some pictures of some fish bones and some uh, large mammal bones and from two different excavations. And what I thought um, to talk about, so as archeologists, we're very interested in animal bones because they tell us a lot about what people did in the past. And in particular, of course, the, the kinds of things that people ate or the kinds of maybe livestock, if they had pigs or domesticated cattle or sheep, um, what kinds of livestock they were raising. But also um, there's a role here for archeological assemblages to tell us about things in the present. And so there's a big field within archeology span that's sort of crossover that's called historical ecology. And so that's what I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about today, um, since the lab that I direct, we do a lot of that kind of work in my lab. Um, so why do we care about historical ecology? Well, California is this really altered landscape. And this is due to a whole bunch of different processes ranging from in the 1850s, when um, colonists came into California, they did a lot of hydraulic mining. So here you see, um, this is a photograph from the late 1800s, people washing away whole hillsides in order to look for gold in particular. Um, and so this was very destructive to the environment. Um, in addition, um, they started planting lots of agricultural fields. They started building fences. They started introducing um, domesticated species like cattle. And this had a tremendous effect on the native species of, uh, of California. And then most recently we get um, the processes of urbanization um, that, and uh, building dams. We have a huge number of dams in California, this is a map of all the, the different dams that have been constructed across um, California, large and small. There are hundreds of different dams. Um, now, of course, we need dams um, because uh, they protect us today from flooding. This is one of my favorite photographs. Uh, this is a picture of Sacramento, old Sacramento in 1861. There was a, a tremendous flood. And so uh, Governor uh, Leland Stanford, in fact, had to exit out of the second story of his home into a boat in order to paddle to the state capitol for his own inauguration. And that's because uh, of constant flooding. And so of course we've needed dams to protect us from those, those flooding events. But at the same time, this has brought uh, tremendous pressures on a lot of the native species in California, many of which are either um, threatened or endangered. They no longer live in their native habitats. They're extirpated from particular areas or they're even extinct. So uh, right here in Davis, we used to have large herds of antelope and tule elk, um, but you keep, they don't exist anymore. They've been ex extirpated from uh, large parts of the Central Valley. Other species here like this Buena Vista uh, Lake ornate shrew is, is extinct. Um, and same thing with our fisheries. Uh, so 
sturgeon and salmon are in uh, steep decline uh, and are endangered and threatened. And other species like this thick tail chub here are also extinct. Now, if we wanna learn about the ecology of those species, um, we, um, need to, uh, we need to try to understand them using archeological collections. And so there's a lot of effort today in habitat restoration and reintroduction of some of these species, at least the ones that aren't extinct, reintroduction of those species into California. And a lot of effort, for example, has gone into salmon habitat restoration. So putting down the right kind of gravel for salmon um, and then breeding salmon uh, and then letting them in loose in, um, in these creeks and rivers. But there's a big question, you know, what is it that we're restoring and how can we make those habitats suitable so that we give the salmon the best opportunities to, to survive? And by looking at archeological collections, those fish that have existed for, uh, those fish species that have existed for thousands of years in California, by studying those, we can gain some insight into the requirements of those different species. So the archeological data can be a great source of data for, uh, for these habitat restoration efforts. Now, what can we learn by looking at animal bones? Um, the thing that I do in my lab is, um, is a lot of chemical work. So you are what you eat. Uh, we make our bones and our teeth. We make those out of the things that we eat. And so the bones essentially contain a chemical record of those things that you ate. So if we took, you know, took samples of our teeth, for example, we could learn a lot about what we had eaten uh, or what we're currently eating. Um, and also tell us about the environment in which, in which we live. Now, even better is that some bones grow in little layers. So for example, this is a, a dog tooth here, and you can see the different growth layers. And each one of these growth layers, once it forms, it records what that dog was eating and where it was living, it records information about the environment. And so by analyzing across these different growth layers, we can get sort of a life history in a particular dog. Um, there's also my favorite fish bone here is the otolith. Uh, each fish has two otoliths. They help with sort of buoyancy and balance in the water. But these otoliths also, they grow sort of like tree rings. Um, they grow one layer every year. And so we can learn a lot about um, these fish by studying uh, otoliths. And salmon in particular uh, has been a topic that we've been studying in my lab. So um, uh, we, we all know about salmon. They, you know, they uh, breed up in these creeks and then they migrate down out into the ocean. They spend a number of years out in the ocean. And then when they mature, they come back up into the Sacramento Valley, in which case um, people would oftentimes catch those salmon, they would eat them, and they would throw those bones into archeological sites where hundreds or thousands of years later, archeologists find those bones. And so by studying those otoliths, then we can learn uh, a number of things for the, with a microscope, we can count the number of rings and we can learn how old that fish was when it was caught. Um, we can also estimate the season, was it caught during fall or was it caught during summer? Um, and then with the isotopes, we can learn more about, we can trace exactly where that fish came from, the environment in which it was born, that's recorded in the center here. And then as it migrated out to the ocean, we can see how long it stayed out at sea and then when it uh, migrated back in. Um, and this, we can do the same thing with other, there's a lot of effort today about reintroducing wolves into California. And so um, if we wanna reconstruct and give wolves the best opportunity to live, we can look at how wolves existed in the past through their bones in archeological sites. Um, we can also do this with, ear, with deer and elk and antelope, so we can trace their migration. So for example, if archeologists find, um, let's say a mandible here with some teeth in it, we can extract those teeth and then take uh, across the different growth lines, we can take different samples and we can estimate all kinds of things about that deer. So um, we can follow maybe the migration of the deer across the landscape as it moved from one place to the next, or maybe going from low elevation to high elevation. So we can understand how deer in the past were using the landscape and that can help us today if we're trying to reintroduce you know, elk, how they migrated across the landscape. So as we reestablish these habitats, then um, the archeological bo bones can inform on what animals, uh, what foods animals were eating in the past, how they migrated, how resilient they were to environmental changes, and all this can help uh, in the present for establishing these new habitats. And so this is that field of historical ecology. 
um, a lot of the research that I'm doing in my lab is related precisely to these kinds of questions. And so the archeological record is this really rich um, resource to understand uh, animal species in the past. So that's uh, quickly what, what we're doing, some of the things that we're doing in my lab, and I'm happy to take some questions. I don't know how long I went here, but I think I did okay, 10 minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Yelmer. Yes, um, if you have questions, you can throw them into the chat and Dr. Irkins will be happy to answer them for you. I guess you must have explained everything really, really well. Yeah, maybe I spoke too fast. <laughs> I to cram in everything in <laughs> 10 minutes. Well, I have a question. Um, what about the little Delta smelt? Um, they seem to be in um, having some serious problems. How can archaeology kind of um, inform Delta smelt ecology? Right. So yeah, we can learn uh, more about the kinds of environments. So the temperature, the salinity um, that fish that Delta smelt in the past at least were able to tolerate. And so we can use that kind of information today to learn about how resilient the, the species are to changes that are taking place in the Delta today, which are really dramatic changes in the, in the Delta. Yelmer, there's a question in the Q&A. Um, what species do you focus on? Ah, so, so far, my lab, we've been focusing on um, two different species. We've been focusing on salmon, um, and we've also been uh, focusing on Sacramento perch. Uh, so Sacramento perch today, in the in the California Delta are extirpated. They don't, no longer exist. The, the species is not extinct. They've been moved and they do exist in small populations in uh, different lakes and reservoirs. But it was Sacramento perch in the Delta were the most important species for native uh, Californian uh, tribes. They caught huge numbers of Sacramento perch. And um, so we've been doing engaging in lots of research with Sacramento perch bones. Um, and then I have another question in the chat. Do you have any current restoration projects, which you uh, sort of answered there, that you're kind of working on tangentially? Yeah, so, I, so I'm not involved directly in restoration, but the, the research, the data that we produce, we hope will be informative to people who are involved in habitat restoration. And so we've been doing a lot of work with salmon um, and been learning some really interesting things about salmon uh, that um, are a little bit surprising and run counter to what a lot of people think about salmon, that salmon didn't behave in the past uh, thousands of years ago the way that they do today. Um, and then uh, we have a, another question. Do you uh, do isotope testing on site or send it out to labs? We do, uh, we do the, a lot of the preparation of the samples in my lab, and then we send it out to a lab, uh, other labs here on the UC Davis campus. So there's a stable isotope facility, and there's another lab that we work with that's called the ICPNS lab, so. And there are a couple of other questions in the Q&A, but um, we are going to move on to our next speaker, and I'm gonna hold those questions until our um, end um, ask an anthropologist or uh, Dr. Irkins might uh, type you an answer back in the Q&A um, un until then, if, you, if, if you're patient. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thanks so, for listening. So, yes, no, thank you so much, uh, Yelmer, for giving a, a really excellent talk. And thank you for the, um, the interesting questions. And so our next speaker coming up is going to be Neetha Iyer. And oh, there she is. And, uh, and then um, Dr. Irkins and I are going to disappear again. And Nitha is going to share her screen and her, oh, and she has an awesome little kitty in her screen too. Um, I always love when pets show up in, uh, in webinars. So awesome. take, it, take it away, Nitha. Hi everyone. Uh, if my cat does come into the screen, I'll try and um, avoid getting distracted. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. This is really exciting. This is the first time that we're doing Biodiversity Museum Day virtually. Um, so we're excited that we could still offer this. Um, before we get started, let's get one thing straight. Um, you saw my talk title and I do talk about poop. 
Um, but everyone poops, right? And you may be, you perhaps have uh, seen these illustrations before if you have kids. This is from uh, a really well-known children's book called Everyone's Poop, Everyone Poops by Tara Gomi. And this is a pretty universal fact. It happens to be especially true in the species that I study, which is the gorilla. Gorillas poop quite a lot. And before we get into the specifics on why on earth I'd even be studying poop in the first place, let's talk about primates and gorillas. Now, some of you in the audience might be curious, why am I studying gorillas in the Department of Anthropology? Um, after all, anthropology is supposed to be the study of humans, right? Well, gorillas are actually our second closest relative after chimpanzees. Our last common ancestor with chimps lived about mm, five to seven million years ago. And then uh, we split from, um, from you know, our, our last common ancestor with chimps and uh, humans with gorillas lived about eight to 12 million years ago. So I'm super interested in animals that are super closely related to humans. And anthropologists like the ones that you're gonna hear from today study humans as well as their close, close living relatives. A primatologist specifically is an anthropologist who studies living primates. And this doesn't just include chimpanzees and gorillas. This also includes several of the other uh, primate species you may have heard of like orangutans, monkeys, um, lemurs. So primatologists study a lot of different animal uh, primate species that are very closely related to us. And I specifically study the gorilla. So where do we find gorillas? One of the perks of my job is that I get to travel to do field work in these really fascinating countries to study these amazing animals. Um, there are currently two living gorilla species that inhabit dense tropical forests and montane forests in equatorial Africa. They live in countries like Nigeria, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is where I worked primarily. So gorillas are quite large, right? Um, and you'd think it'd be pretty easy to find them in the forest. In reality, it takes quite a while to locate these, these primates in these super dense forests. And I do work in secondary forests that happens to have a lot of vegetation that makes it hard to find them sometimes. So I do work in the DRC. And sometimes it's super hard to find them, but what you wanna do is to try and find them using different traces that you might find in your habitat. So part of a primatologist's job entails traveling through this thick vegetation, looking for signs and traces, such as you know the remnants of food plants that they were eating, or if you're really lucky, you can potentially find a fist print in the ground, which is you know super rare, but that it's really special when you do find that. And we follow them. So we follow these traces and we try and figure out where these gorillas are. And wherever we study primates, the work that we do is really impossible without the skill and expertise of the local community members who live near these forests. So once we find these gorillas, what do we do next, right? We locate them, we find them. And this is a picture here of one of the gorilla groups that I study. Well, not all gorilla groups are super easy to observe. Um, in fact, most gorillas are quite wild and unhabituated to human presence. So over time, people have slowly got into this process of habituating animals to humans that would allow us to observe them without really posing a threat to them. So when you observe gorillas or other primates that are habituated, generally they don't perceive us as a threat. And so this group that I study is, um, it lives in a tropical forest in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's a social group that consists of about 23 um, individuals. And let me tell you, observing uh, primates in the wild is, is really an exhilarating experience. For my dissertation research, I've spent over a year collecting um, information and data and studying a particular uh, gorilla family in the DRC. These gorillas uh, are a subspecies called the Grower's gorilla. And let me tell you, they're really magnificent. Um, they live in these family groups, groups, like I mentioned, that includes a dominant male called the silverback. Um, they're called the silverback. You can probably see on my background here because they have this silver um, fur on their back. Um, several females and um, all of their offspring. So this is super cool, right? This kind of mirrors sometimes the dynamics that we see in human families. And when I'm out there, I'm collecting a lot of data. This includes super basic information, the who, what, when, why of science, right? What, what, are, what am I collecting? What's the kind of data that I, uh, that I note down? Well, I'm taking down notes on gorilla identification, on the food species that they're eating, the time and date or the season that I'm observing the gorillas, their behaviors, as well as their habitat. 
And all of this information is super helpful when you want to try and build a picture of the social context of the gorilla. So who is interacting with who in the family, as well as the environmental context. So where are they, you know, interacting? What's the kind of habitat they're in, interacting in? So over time, you can gather tons of information about food species that primates eat. And gorillas have quite a wide uh, diet breadth. You know, they eat fruits, um, bark, leaves, ton of different food species. And I'm also interested in how gorillas move within their habitat, because as you can imagine, they have to move within their forest to try and find these different food species. And gorillas move quite a lot. So uh, the gorilla species that I study has quite a large home range because they incorporate a lot of fruit in their diet, which tends to be dispersed within the habitat. So I'm collecting information about basically where they're moving within their habitat. I use a GPS tracker to learn a little bit more about their daily movements. How long are they traveling each day? How long does it take for them to get from one food source to another? Do they travel more in some seasons than others? Those are all questions that I'm interested in answering. Um, I also study social behavior. So basically trying to understand who interacts with who over time. And over time, you can really gather some really uh, detailed information about who is interacting with whom within a group. So these are pictures of two gorillas within the family that I was studying. This is a black back, which is kind of an adolescent male and a juvenile, really young male. Um, so this allows us to kind of infer social dynamics within a particular family. This can help us construct what are called social networks. You, maybe you're on Facebook or some kind of social media. You may have that one friend that you send messages a lot to, or you, know, you tweet at a lot. And there may be some people in the group that you never interact with within your social network. So gorillas are much like humans. They have social networks in which they interact a lot with certain individuals. And some of them, they really don't care quite, um, quite you know, <laughs> they don't care as much about them. So. This is all because some of the data that I'm collecting. And as you can imagine, I probably look quite strange to a gorilla. Some of my behaviors maybe need to be documented in a notebook or a field notebook as well. So like I mentioned before, I collect and study gorilla poop or dung. Gorilla dung is this treasure tro trove of information. You can find out what food species they're eating if you don't have access to that direct observation. Um, and you can even you know, learn the identity of a, a gorilla through genetic mechanisms or, or methods. Um, you can learn about their relatedness, their sex. And what I'm interested in is their parasites. And you can find a lot of parasites within their dung. So part of my dissertation involves studying parasites that are called nematodes, which are worms that live in the gastrointestinal tracts of gorillas. So um, this, this is kind of like my, my work here at, at Davis. I study um, how gorillas get infected, why these gorillas get more infected perhaps than others, and where gorillas go in the forest and where they get these infections. Now, nematodes have a really complex life cycle. They are parasites that live within the gastrointestinal tract and are um, excreted through the dung. So I collect the dung, I look at the dung and there, there's eggs, these nematodes um, release eggs within, within the dung. These eggs eventually develop into larva that can then go on to infect another gorilla that comes along and you know just touches the, the larva that's in the environment. That larva travels within the body of the gorilla and nestles in the uh, little nooks and crannies of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And then they develop into an adult that once again starts producing these eggs. So this is like this complex life cycle that requires a lot of different parts to fit in for these parasites to survive and to continue to reproduce. So I'm super fascinated and, and I find a lot of information from the dung, even though most people maybe kind of <laughs> don't like looking at dung or studying dung. So these are all parts of the questions that I, I study and a lot of other primatologists study. And unfortunately, uh, gorillas and a lot of primates are critically endangered. They live in forests that are continually shrinking due to deforestation. So I'm hoping some of the work that I can do here can help inform conservation efforts and decisions um, and you know, for, for gorillas, but for other animals that live in these really beautiful forests. Um, so I hope that you know some of the work that I'm going to do. I'm in my fifth year now in uh, the PhD program. Um, I hope that some of this work can be applied and used by conservation NGOs and governmental agencies that are uh, living um, in these in these countries where uh, gorillas are found. So. 
I also have a lot of questions. Like part of the job of a scientist is to continuously ask questions. And the more questions I ask, the more unsolved <laughs> answers, you know, the more unsolved questions remain. So if you have questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, and I think I might be on time here. I hope I haven't gone over. Um, Thank you. No, that was great. Thank you so much. And in fact, actually, you do have some questions in the chat room. Um, the first one is, do the gorillas you study have different personalities? And do those personalities affect their social interactions? Oh, you need to un unmute. Sorry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a that's a really great question. So um, a lot of people who study animals have there's this entire field of literature uh, and study called animal personality research. Um, and with with primates like gorillas that are super charismatic and you know a lot like humans, um, sometimes it's hard and you have to try and not anthrop anthropomorphize or put your human projections or personalities onto gorillas, but there's definitely a lot of variation um, within behaviors that you would see in gorillas. So there's some gorillas that are more social. They might be, you know, more interactive with, the, with other group members. Um, some that are maybe just a little bit more elusive, some that are like super kooky, like some of the young ones just have really interesting personalities. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a ton of behavioral variation that we see in, in gorillas. And then the next question, Nitha, is when you showed the aerial photo showing gorilla movements, they seem to stay in the area with lots of visible tracks. Are those man-made tracks or roads? Oh, that's, yeah, great question. So um, most of the, the, the habitats that they live in are pretty dense. Um, they, there's one road that goes through this, the particular field site that I, I um, was showing there. Um, there are there are some man-made tracks in that you know there are trails you you can't quite see them in the um, in the aerial view so I think maybe what you were seeing was the the um, like a, a view of the the tracks that were just saved in the in the image but you can actually see the the aerial view however they do reuse parts of their habitat and they sometimes will use trails that they've used before and that's kind of an interesting process that is important for the research that i do so if they're you know if they walk along and they poop a lot in this trail and then two days later they come back to the same trail are they going to get infected with parasites um so yeah they they do uh do, they do have these like trails that they they may reuse over time and one last question before we move on to the next one is, do the parasites you study affect the health of the gorillas and do they affect conservation efforts? That's a great question. It's also a question that um, people in my dissertation committee asked a lot. Um, so, you know, gastrointestinal nematodes and parasites, we often think about like getting rid of worms. We take a deworming medication to try and get rid of them for humans, um, but they're ubiquitous in nature. They're found in everything. Um, they're not quite as deadly as something like Ebola, which infects and is very deadly to gorillas. Um, they're not quite as bad as maybe getting a virus, um, but they're they're constantly within the um, the animal. It's you know they don't really shed them immediately. They don't recover very quickly or as quickly as maybe you would recover from a, a, a respiratory cold. Um, so over time, they can have a long-term impact. And if a gorilla is super stressed out or if it's infected with another parasite, there may be these um, interacting effects that would exacerbate certain conditions. And parasites are constantly sucking resources from their hosts. So there is some kind of health dynamic there, although there's still a lot of data that needs to be collected on that. Well, thank you so much, Nitha. And um, so remember, everyone, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A and we will answer as many as we can in between uh, the talks. And then whatever ones we are not able to answer between the talks, we will have um, a segment, a uh, Ask an Archaeologist segment at the very end of the talks, where we will answer um, any questions we are not able to get to and any additional ones. So, um, so I'm very excited to hear our next speaker who is going to um, share her screen, um, Maya Adegboyega, um, who is a also a doctoral student in the anthropology department here. Hi. Hello. So let me just do that really quickly. Lovely. Okay. Hi, everyone. 
Good day. My name is Mayowa Adibuega, and um, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today to tell you a little bit about the work that I'm doing here at UC Davis. Today, I'm going to tell you about my work on fossil reconstruction, the techniques I use, and what these fossils can reveal to us in the end. So who am I? Well, first, I am a PhD candidate, as I said, and I am from Lagos, Nigeria, and I am a paleoanthropologist. A paleoanthropologist is simply a person who studies the journey of human, human evolution. And there are many ways to do this, but I focus on human fossils. So what do I do specifically, you may ask? Well, I study the evolution of the shape of the human pelvis, or hips, as we tend to call them. I look at how the pelvis has changed over millions of years, and I look at how those changes affect how we use them. So if you're anything like my parents at this point, you're asking, why did I choose to study human hips? Well, the pelvis is important for many things we do as humans, like standing up and walking around on two legs. Um, it's important for childbirth, which is necessary to give us the next generation of humans. And it even plays a role in body heat regulation, so thermoregulation. And this is because the width of your pelvis is about the width of your body. And the volume of your body, which is affected by width, actually affects how heat is lost and gained or retained by your body. So to understand how um, we've changed, we have to go very far back in time and look at the bones of the human species that came before us. There's just one problem. Fossils are very rare. And when we find them, they tend to be pretty smashed up, distorted, and they tend to be missing many, many pieces. This is due to the pressure from the earth lying around them. It crushes them, especially since the pelvis has a big cavity in the middle. It's very easy, imagine it being lying, laying in the ground, it's very easy for it to collapse on itself. So a lot of the time, before we can really learn anything about those individuals, we need to first reconstruct these fossils. Now, sometimes reconstructions involve filling in cracks and replacing missing fragments, like the two fossils on the screen in the, with the black background. But other times you need to actually replace whole pieces of bone, like the picture at the bottom right corner. Now you also need to know a little bit or a lot actually about human anatomy and how the pelvis works because that information will guide you towards a better reconstruction. So now I'm gonna walk you through a reconstruction of a hip, the hips of a very special fossil. So this is the Kabara to Neanderthal, AKA Moshe. Moshe is an adult male Neanderthal from the Kabara cave in Israel. It's in Mount Carmel, Israel, and it's estimated to be about 60,000 years old. Now, the Neanderthals were our closest human relatives, so my friend Nita just talked to you about our closest living relatives, but if you look at the fossil record, the closest relatives to humans were the Neanderthals. We actually share about 99.7% of our DNA, which means that only 0.3% of our DNA is distinctly modern human, and only 0.3% of their DNA is distinctly Neanderthal. So the Neanderthals lived all over Europe in West and Western and Central Asia as well, and they lived from about 200,000 to 40,000 years, which means that modern humans like us actually overlapped with them in space and time. In fact, it is known from genomic research that Neanderthals interbred with humans. So chances are many of you have about, let's say 2% Neanderthal DNA in your genome. Okay. Um, they're very similar to us in many ways. They have pretty similar brain sizes, but they're also shorter limbed. They have bigger bodies, really large rib cages. So they're stockier than we were. Now Kabara, um, as you can see, Moshe, as I like to call him, is a relatively complete fossil. A lot of the time you only have a few bones or fragments, um, but if you look lower, you can actually see that Kabara is missing a big chunk of its pelvis. In fact, the, le uh, the left hip bone is missing a huge chunk. Now I know the left is on your right, but remember when you're facing someone, your right becomes their left. So the first thing we do is we take the bones of the hips, we scan them with the CT scanner, and those images are uploaded into a 3D program. And the program that I use is called Avizo, A-V-I-Z-O. So these images that you're seeing on the screen are actually the scans of the fossils. And they look pretty real. In fact, the first time I saw these pictures, I thought those were the actual bones. But no, these are the images from the scans. Um, the next thing in Avizo, we identify each fragment and then we create what we call a surface rendering for each one. So that's like a computer replica for each piece. 
And because each of those pieces are made separately, like the one you're seeing on the screen, um, you can treat each of those surface renderings as individual fragments. So I was able to identify 39 pieces on the right hip bone, which is the good hip bone, the one that's not missing that huge chunk, and about four pieces from the sacrum, which holds it all together in the back. So once I had made the surface rendering for each fragment, I could move each piece around, kind of like the P P way you can see them at the last picture. And then I could actually put those bones back correctly. Now, what you couldn't see from that first image was that even from the bones that you're seeing, some of them are not quite in the correct position. Some of those fragments have shifted. So being able to move them around allows me to correct some of those distortions. Now, this is where my knowledge of pelvic anatomy comes in, because I have to have a pretty good idea of where each piece should go based on how human bones, past and present, are aligned. So one example, for example, of some of the distortion that happened even with the right hip bone that is more complete is this. So in the first picture, the A, you can see that's the original. You can see that that bottom piece, so I actually have a hip bone right here with me. So that bottom piece right here, which is the base, is crooked in A. So B is my reconstruction. I was able to straighten out those pieces into a smooth curve like we would expect. C was the reconstruction done by a colleague and friend of mine. Um, and his reconstruction, he decided to make it a little straighter. So D is just the overlapping picture showing how each of those three, um, um, I guess, pelt, um, hips are, look kind of different from each other. So you can see the D rises up, the, the green one rises up a lot more, the blue one is somewhere in the middle, and the gray sort of sits somewhere as well. So once I had the right hip bone just as I wanted it, I made a replica, I just flipped it over, and so now I have a bone from the other side. Now you might be wondering, what happened to the original left side? Well, I made the decision to leave it out of the reconstruction because it was too badly damaged. And it was much easier to do a reconstruction where I just made a mirror image of the really good right side. Then to make sure that the sacrum fit the second hip bone like it fit the original one, um, I had to also do some reconstruction here as well. So as you can see with the original sacrum, it's not very symmetrical. Now this is largely because we're not perfectly symmetrical anyway. No one is. But Moshe, in fact, is, is more unsymmetrical than most. He has a lot of differences on the left and on the right. But then there's also distortion due to the result of um, fossilization. All that pressure being applied to it has distorted some of those bones. Now, because my left and right hip bone are about the same, are the same bone, I had to make sure that now we had the um, left side having the right side's sacrum, sort of. So what I did is, again, I made a replica. I flipped it over. And then I cut off the unwanted side on both of them so that it had also the both sides that fit both hip bones perfectly. So now that I had three good bones and I was able to assemble them using the same 3D um, software, I was able to then build the fossil back. Um, and I had a colleague, the same colleague from before, recreate the whole pelvis as well. Now, in the past, interestingly enough, this particular pelvis has been reconstructed before, but it was done by hand and it was quite a while ago. So this technique allows us to create more than one replica. It allows us to correct mistakes, allowed us to make a, a number of possibilities. Now, it's important to know that each fossil reconstruction is never going to be a perfect reconstruction of what the individual looked at in life, but it is a, still an important recreation that can help us understand that individual specifically or um, Neanderthals in general. So finally, we 3D printed our reconstructions and here is one of them in my hand. So this is the blue one, the one that I did. Um, and then we were able to take measurements, compare it to the old reconstruction, and compare it to other species as well. So thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to how I use modern uh, technology to help us study the past. Um, and if you have any questions, I would love them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, my sincere apologies. That was um, that was my fault that there was some distraction coming in. Um, oh. Dr. Dr. Irkins wandered into my uh, lab and I <laughs> realized that my mic was still on. So I sincerely apologize to everyone. Um, but uh, we have some questions in the Q&A for you. Um, the first one is, how is the DNA of Neanderthals studied if they have been extinct for thousands of years? Good question. 
Oh, so that's great. When we find fossils, sometimes, if we're very lucky, we can actually extract some DNA from them. So even though a lot of DNA um, denatures over time, some of it can still be preserved for about an um, amount of time. So we've been able to find some fossils that have some DNA that we can look at. Awesome. Um, and then the next question is, are Neanderthal pelvises different from modern human ones? If they are, do you know how they would have affected ne Neanderthal childbirth? Ah, that's one of the major questions that I've been trying to answer, and that is a big part of um, my research. Um, so they are very different from ours. There are a lot of similarities, but like I said, there's a lot of differences. For example, the Neanderthal pelvis is much wider than ours is. Also, our pelvis is also, so if I look at the pelvic canal, if I do this, the Neanderthal is a little bit more like this, while we are kind of rounder. So at the inlet, the part where the baby first enters, we are wider, actually, side to side. That makes sense. But at the outlet, where the baby eventually ejects from the body, we're longer front to back. So this means that modern human babies have to rotate themselves twice because one time is for the rotation of your head, which is angled this way, and your shoulders this way to pass through that first width. And then the second time, they have to readjust to pass through the other one. So human birth is actually one of the more complicated ones in the hominin lineage. Neanderthals don't seem to have that much of a difference between the orientation at the top and at the bottom. So even though their babies would have had to have some time squeezing out, it's not quite as complex and as complicated as the modern humans. And we think that part of this is due to the fact that modern humans um, evolved different features that were probably more beneficial for more active locomotion or for thermoregulation. So there are many theories as to why we evolved what is essentially a more difficult birth, but it seems like there had to be some trade-off for some features over others. Thank you. That's uh, making me re rethink the two children that I birthed even <laughs> more. Um, <laughs> and it also makes me think maybe I, I think being a Neanderthal, have, having a child would have been preferable. <laughs> It, might, it wasn't necessarily easier. I guess the complication is just a different way. They still had pretty tight squeeze as well. So mm -hmm. no, I was no, just thinking of the double short. rotation. Yeah, that part. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, the, the first one had a very, very large head. <laughs> um, I'm the, the graduate students know why I'm chuckling because that one now is six foot six and he's still <laughs> huge. <laughs> Um, and uh, another question we have is, when you make reconstructions of the pelvis, do you use Neanderthal models or human models? Well, that's a good question. So, interestingly, there's not a lot of complete Neanderthals. In fact, this is one of the most complete Neanderthal pelvises that are out there. A lot of the time we're using human models, we try to, you know, follow some of the general trends in how anatomy works. And those don't tend to differ that much. But it, it is one thing that we are conscious of in the fact that because we don't have a lot of comparative species, um, specimens to look at, that we are making a lot of inferences based on fragmentary fossils and a lot of them based on modern humans. Thank you so much. That was really great. Welcome. And um, we are on time for our um, next speaker. So if um, Corey Johnson uh, is up next, and so if you want to share your screen, Corey. Um, so Corey is also a um, doctoral student in the anthropology department, and he's going to be kind of continuing our study of kind of early hominids and uh, with his discussion of the stone tools from China. Take it away. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to all the other speakers uh, who have presented so far today, and thank you all for joining us um, on this uh, beautiful afternoon. So happy biodiversity, everyone, and welcome. Like Chris, like Chris mentioned, my name is Corey Johnson, and I'm a PhD candidate here at UC Davis, and my research um, is addressing problems in the field of Paleolithic archaeology. So, so far we, today, we've talked about archaeology, we've talked about human evolution, and you can think about Paleolithic archaeology as pretty much just the archaeology of human evolution. And as Chris mentioned, uh, the part of the world in which I'm conducting my research is in China. And the part of the archaeological record that I'm looking at in China is the stone artifact archaeological record. And I've got some examples of some stone artifacts from the site that I'm uh, working on here, pictured on the right of the screen. And We'll be talking about these artifacts today, and we'll be talking about the Neowan Basin. But before we can talk about the cool stuff, the artifacts, I think I should introduce 
the site that I'm working at, Neo1 Basin, or it's the region of sites that I'm working at. So this is a picture of the Neo1 Basin. And you can see myself here with some of my colleagues um, as we're touring the basin, going to different sites in 2017. And I first came to Neo1 Basin in, no, in 2018, excuse me, because I first came to Neo1 Basin in 2017, just very briefly, um, with my advisor and another PhD student, PhD candidate now in our, uh, our department, just to check it out. And uh, because I had heard about the site and uh, was very curious about it because of its suspected age, which we'll talk about. And upon visiting it, I immediately fell in love and have been working in the Iwan Basin since. Um, so this is in 2018 when I first uh, participated in excavations at the site we'll be mostly talking about today, Don Guto, um, which is a site being excavated by the Institute Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology, uh, which is based in Beijing. And uh, yeah, so this is what that excavation looks like at Dong Guto. So we've got uh, the site here. It's a pretty big site. The site uh, first uh, was excavated in the 1980s and excavations have been taking place um, in the 90s and the 2000s. And this project that I'm participating in began in 2016. So I joined in 2017, about a year after it started and have been participating in it ever since. And you can see some like different views of what the site looks on the inside, what it looks like from the outside. And some of my uh, friends and colleagues who I get to work with and uh, have gotten to know so well over the years. All right, so what do we know so far about the Neowan Basin? Uh, the research history. So fossils at Neowan Basin were first discovered in the 1920s by some French priests who were in the area doing, uh, what's it called? It's uh, uh, when they go out and they, they, they do their pilgrimage or something. Um, but the archeology span began in the 1970s. So they found these fossils, these, these French priests and people they were working with, they found these fossils in the region, you know, of deer and mammoth and all these other animals we'll be talking about more, but there was no recognition of archeology span in the region until the 1970s. And since then, there have been dozens of sites that have been discovered at Niwan Basin. And uh, you can see kind of an outline of the basin here in this location within China and another picture of what it looks like, uh, another one that I took. So the chronology, so the age of the archeology span in the region is something that's been uh, part of you know, scientific investigation since its recognition. And at this point, the date to about 1.7 to 1 million years ago. So some of the earliest sites in all of East Asia, in fact, sites that uh, kind of paint this picture of the first expansion of human ancestors out of Africa um, during what we call the early Pleistocene. Uh, but there are some younger sites in the basin too. So some of them as young as 13,000 years old that uh, are, are not part of the, the big picture of human evolution, but the, the tail end of it, you can think. Um, and there are some hominin fossils too in the region, but they kind of fall in the middle. They fall in between, between the earliest, the earliest estimates of the site and the youngest sites in the region. And these are thought to date between 350 to 250 or maybe 125 and 100,000 years old. There's, there's some uh, uh, discussions going on about the age of these hominin fossils, which we'll talk a little bit about too. Uh, so what was the, the environment like at Neowan Basin Pass? It was very different than it was today. So it was thought to be this, Neowan Basin was thought to be this lakeshore environment um, that was kind of cold or temperate in terms of its climate. Um, and that uh, was populated by all these spruce trees and pine trees, and also inhabited by steppe mammoth, woolly rhinos, steppe bison, deer, wolves, giant cats. We don't know if they were tigers or not, but some kind of, maybe, maybe some kind of you know, lion, uh, but also, of course, uh, small animals too, which we'll see. But my research focuses on the Paleolithic stone artifacts. Um, and so far, um, our picture of what the technology looks like in Neowan Basin is that there were what we call unprepared cores and flakes, which are kind of like this simple kind of technology of making sharp flakes from stone. So breaking off pieces of a stone in a kind of random or, or you know, unplanned way to make sharp flakes that you can use as cutting knives to you know, whittle wood or to butcher an animal or do all kinds of things. Um, but recently, there's also been some uh, research that's shown from the site that I've been working at, Don Guto, that there are some prepared uh, cores too that have this prismatic shape to them. And these small blades that might've come from those prismatic cores. And this prepared kind of core is one that would have taken a little bit more foresight, a little bit more executive functioning than the unprepared technologies that uh, were found um, at the beginning of the record. And my work so far is I recognized a couple more technological uh, 
attributes of the site as well. A different kind of prepared core that has this asymmetrical profile and these, uh, these cores on flakes. So the flakes that come from cores then being recycled into cores themselves. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So these are some of the fossils from some of the earliest sites in Neowan Basin and the different animals that these fossils belong to. So we see there's step mammoths, there's step bison, there's woolly rhinos, all these big cold adapted species, but also little cold adapted species too, like this pika from the site of uh, Xiaosheng Liang. Um, and so this gives us a picture of what the, the landscape looked like, the kinds of animals that were living alongside the, the human ancestors that were uh, inhabiting the region uh, in the past. And this is what those fossils from the site of Zhujiao, those hominin fossils, those human ancestor fossils that date to about 350 or maybe 100,000 years ago look like. And uh, one of the interesting things about these fossils is because of their age and because of their morphology, something that uh, Milo was talking about, morphology of these individuals, is it's not quite clear exactly what kind of uh, hominin group these fossils belong to. It's definitely members of our genus Homo, but there's some discussions about whether these are early examples of Homo sapiens in East Asia, or maybe an elusive other kind of species or subspecies of our, of our lineage called Denisovans, which in a nutshell, you can kind of think of as like the Neanderthals of East Asia. But it's really difficult um, in terms of identifying the species as a Denisovan or not, is we haven't gotten the DNA from them. Maya talked a little bit about how important DNA is for understanding human evolution. And that's one thing uh, that distinguishes Denisovans from Neanderthals and from our species, Homo sapiens, is their genetics. And because there has been no genetics taken from these fossils, we can't quite say they're Denisovans yet, but they're definitely a candidate in some people's minds. Um, another interesting thing about them is that they seem to have this uh, life history that was much like our own, which wouldn't be surprising if they are Homo sapiens, but if they're Denisovans, brings up some interesting questions. But what we're really interested in today is the technology, the stone tools, right? And that's uh, uh, what we see here. We see some flakes, which we see in the top row here. These are the pieces of stone that were broken off of cores like we see here. And there's also some of these small blades um, that come from the site of Dongoto where I'm working. Um, and those small blades are thought to come from these kinds of cores. And these are those prismatic cores um, that I mentioned before. And they're prismatic in the sense that they have this uh, prismatic shape. It's you know pyramidal, like a prism. And they're prepared cores because they're thought to have been shaped in a certain way to produce flakes of a certain shape uh, as well. These elongated, uh, narrow kinds of blanks um, from platforms that have this uh, prepared surface. And so this is the surface, this is the top here that we're looking at from above. This is what would have been struck to break off pieces um, along the surface here. And it's thought that maybe there was some uh, preparation, some shaping of this surface going on before these pieces were broke off, which suggests there's this planning, this, this kind of uh, different steps that are taking place um, that have been uh, predetermined uh, before being enacted. Uh, that is uh, a far cry from what we're seeing with these unprepared cores, which kind of just they're rotating the cores in their hands, it's taking advantage of any kind of uh, suitable platform that they can uh, exploit. And so this is what had been recognized at Dongato before I started working there. And then this is all looking at material that had been previously excavated from Dongato. But with our new excavations at Dongato, I've recognized these three other categories or two new categories and some more examples of those prismatic cores from the site as well. So these are those same prismatic cores. They're a little bit different. I'm calling them narrow prismatic cores because there's some other things going on with the treatment of some of their profile um, in terms of their shaping or perhaps you know, their reduction. Um, some more of those you know, long and thin blanks, but also these asymmetric cores. And what I mean by asymmetric is there's two surfaces to these cores and one surface is flat and the other surface is more rounded, it's more convex. And it's this flat surface that was the preferential surface. This was the main surface that was used to remove flakes. And there were, uh, am I running out of time? I'm seeing something in the chat. Oh, excuse me, I'm gonna blow back up. Um, if I'm running out of time, I'll be quick. So this is the main surface they were moving flakes from. And then they were preparing that surface here on the asymmetrical side. And there's some blanks that come, seem to come from these cores too that I believe are related to this. And then here's some of those cores on flakes that also have prepared platforms and are indicative of lithic recycling going on at the site. So to wrap things up, um, the significance of Neowan Basin archeology, span it provides clues to how technology was changing during the Paleolithic in East Asia. Because um, it used to be thought that technological evolution during the Paleolithic in East Asia was stagnant 
before the arrival of you know, the people who live there today, homo sapiens. But this view has changed a lot over the last 20 years with new discoveries that have taken place in China and other parts of East Asia. And so the question no longer is, was there technological change in East Asia? But it said, how much of that change can be explained by local innovations, by hominid populations that were living there um, uh, locally, and how much can be explained by new groups coming into the region that either met those populations or replaced them uh, throughout human evolution in the region. So thank you all again for coming, uh, if you speak Chinese, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. That was really interesting. Um, I, uh, I always, I, I'm, I'm also uh, married to somebody who specializes in stone tools as an archaeologist, so um, I uh, have a, a, a strong appreciation for stone tool analysis as well. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please put them into the Q&A. While we are um, waiting for any additional questions, I'm going to um, go to some of the other uh, Q&A questions. And uh, oh, someone has a question regarding the last slide. Yes. The um, slide of me with uh, my colleagues in the trench. Ah, it says, uh, do any of the animal bones indicate what, if any, hunting was happening in that area, especially connected to those stone tools that you are analyzing? Really good question. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, my colleague, uh, uh, Xiao Min, uh, is working on that. And uh, we don't have any you know, thing to share with you yet. But um, from observations just on the site, from the, the fossils that are being excavated with these stone artifacts from Dongato, there are some indications of uh, oh. hominin butchery taking place. Um, some some really clear signs, Chris, that I know you'd appreciate, because I know John is a stone artifact archaeologist, and you being a zooarchaeologist, I know you'd appreciate some of these, these marks on the bones. They're looking like uh, chop marks that are going on, separating the tendons of this uh, horse uh, metapodial, uh, and perhaps maybe uh, recycling as a soft hammer, something that Xiaomin is going to uh, determine with her analysis. She's a, she uh, is a postdoc at the IVPP. Yeah. Thanks, Corey. There's another question here. When was the photo taken? And I believe it's the one in your last slide. So I'm yeah, okay. wondering when you were there, probably pre-COVID, I'm guessing. That was uh, 2019. And yes, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, the excavation wasn't able to take place last summer, but here's hoping for this summer, right? Yes, as we as we all are um, hoping, hoping for um, vaccinations will we'll speed up. Yes. Um, Okay, and I think we are about ready. Oh, and there's some no, there's some some poor things we need to remove from the from the yeah, chat. That's okay. Fine. Don't worry about that. Um, okay, uh, and we're going to move on to our next speaker, and that is um, going to be Kat Marucci. So, if Kat, if you want to turn your um, your screen back on. Hello. Let me get started here. I didn't share with you guys. Okay. I think someone needs to be removed. Yep, um, just doing that right now. Great. Oh, and share screen. Okay. Great. Okay, so my name is Kat Marucci, and I am a second year PhD student in the Evolutionary Anthropology program. So for that reason, um, much of what I'm presenting today is kind of the theoretical foundation of the project that I hope to carry out. Um, I won't actually be presenting on kind of the methods that I'm doing to get at this question, but if you have questions or curiosities about that moving forward, I'd be happy to answer some of those in the Q&A session. So um, I'm a zooarchaeologist. I study human-animal interactions in the past, um, and specifically, I'm really interested in how the process of animal domestication actually influenced disease transmission, both um, within human populations and animal populations. Um, so to start, I'm just going to give a massive overview of zoonotic disease. Um, I think maybe in another year, this might need a little bit more explanation, but zoonotic diseases are very on our mind, as it turns out. Um, we have all lived through a series of zoonotic infections. So coronavirus, obviously, the avian flu, the swine flu, Ebola virus. Um, and zoonotic diseases are any disease that arise due to germs that arise from an animal or human and are spread between the two. 
So this is a bi-directional relationship. Um, human diseases can impact animals, animal diseases can impact humans or other species of animals. Um, and so domestication, how does this play into it all? Domestication is basically a mutualistic relationship between humans and animals or plants, um, I will be focusing on animals, that does benefit both participants. So usually a, a human will engage a domestic kind of relationship with a target species, depending on a number of different reasons. It could be the desire for certain byproducts that that species can provide, such as access to meat, dairy, wool, um, work, if you will. Um, but most domestic animals actually arose around the emergence of agriculture, so 11,000 to 10,000 years ago. Um, but some domestic species actually arose earlier, some later. And this is, again, a beneficial relationship for both counterparts. So humans get access to very valuable resources. Um, we build our economies around animal byproducts. Um, and domestic animals benefit from basically having human care, um, oversight of their breeding, health management, um, husbandry management. And this has actually resulted in such a huge population impact in terms of the number of new domestic animals that are brought into every single generation. Um, and from a fitness standpoint, domestication is, is really great because we really have beefed up the quantity of domestic animals in the environment. Um, so domestication results in a number of physical, genetic, and behavioral changes of our target domestic species. However, it also results in a lot of biological and behavioral changes in humans. Such changes include um, humans have to put forth a lot of time investment in terms of creating excess food storage to food storage to hold extra food, um, food production to actually feed their domestic animals rather than just feeding themselves, a lot of monitoring and care in their livestock species or their other domestic animals. Um, and we see a lot of physical and genetic behavioral changes in other domestic animals, such as changes in size, or genetics is a given one because you start a domestic relationship with a wild precursor. And by the end of the relationship, more often than not, you have actually a whole new species because you put this population through a very intensive population bottleneck and you've selectively bred them. There are a number of things about domestication that are relevant for the spread of disease that I really wanna hit on so that it's in all of our minds as we move forward. One, um, domestication alters natural biodiversity. Two, it really alters the density of target animal populations that later become domestic animals. And it also alters and increases the frequency and intensity of contact between human and animals. So as far as zoonotic diseases go, the minimum precursor for a zoonotic disease to occur is that there must be some sort of contact between humans and another animal species. That could be direct contact through the species that is harboring the disease, or it can be through direct indirect contact. So through kind of a secondary um, agent such as a mite or something along those lines. But moving forward, we are gonna keep these concepts in mind as we kind of consider how disease might play a role in domestication. So I, I work in Peru. I study the domestication of the llama and the alpaca. And um, broadly, we have our domestic camelids, the llama and the paco, alpaca, which we all know and love, and their wild precursors, the vicuña and the guanaco. I will preface this with the domestication process and timeline for domestic camelids is actually, in South America, is actually not very well understood. Um, we have some compelling evidence about when and how they arose. Um, and most people would put the origins of domestic forms in the central Andes of Peru. Most people think it was around 6,000 years ago, but this is something that hasn't actually been definitively stated yet. Um, and the way that we have kind of come up with that hypothesis is over time, zooarchaeologists really like to look at changes in animal mortality through time. So a typical healthy population with a normal mortality um, behavior, so you kind of, you're born, you might make it, you might not, especially depending on what type of species you are. You might have a lot of siblings. There might be a lot of sibling competition. Um, a lot of times we see a lot of death in early young animals. But once an animal moves into kind of its prime age, its adulthood, they're healthy, they've kind of figured out how to compete and like sustain themselves, um, you don't see as much death. But then obviously, you know, we see a lot of kind of age-related attrition and kind of loss due to natural causes. 
So a normal kind of healthy population, stable population, if you will, will often show a lot of um, young animals dying and then a lot of older animals dying. And in the middle, you actually don't see that many kind of intermediate age animals dying. This is what's called a U-shaped curve. Um, and you can kind of see, this might not be the best image, but it does go up here. So this is kind of your fancy cursive view, if you will. Um, but what we found in the Peruvian zooarchaeological record is a change in the mortality profiles over time. So specifically, um, around 6,000 years ago, we saw a huge, huge, huge increase in the number of neonatal or infant animals. Um, and although normally we would say, okay, you know, neonatal animals are kind of what we would expect to see the highest class of deaths in a record, this was so far beyond anything that had ever been recorded in wild animal populations that scholars began to wonder whether or not this had something to do with something else that was going on in the environment. And when you step back and you think, what's the biggest difference between say a really young animal and an older animal? Oftentimes, you know, things like predation, sure that might count, but really what we start thinking about um, when we see these types of numbers is that younger animals have just not as strong immune systems as older animals do. They're more naive to a lot of pathogens in their environment and therefore susceptible to disease and often succumb to disease more. So interestingly enough, um, it's really hard to study infectious disease in the archeological record because a lot of times infectious diseases, they, they don't manifest in skeletal structures. There are some um, kind of cases that do absolutely do that. But really when we're looking at catastrophic disease, infectious disease, this is happening so fast in a population. There's no time for the skeletal elements which we can actually appreciate in the record to show signs of disease. So, I think this is actually a very good hypothesis that seeing this increase in young animals, even though it has not been tested yet fully, is due to disease for a number of reasons. And so one of those things that I want to point out is the difference in how disease kind of tra traverses through wild habitats and kind of normal healthy ecosystems that are highly biodiverse and that between domestic settings. So if we make our one llama here sick, say he kind of comes down with an opportunistic pathogen, um, he might interact with a rabbit over here and that rabbit may be able to contract that disease. But unless the pathogen that is causing that disease has certain adaptations that enable that rabbit to infect its species, probably the rabbit's gonna die off. And actually that means like the infectious node is gone. We just eliminated some of the infectious force in our population might interact with a, um, a fox, but fox isn't susceptible. So in healthy ecosystems that are highly biodiverse, we actually don't see a huge harboring of disease unless we have um, really kind of unique and particular diseases that are specific to a host population. Um, but biodiversity is something that really does actually help keep disease levels down generally. So this is gonna be our domestication simulation. And we start with our one infected animal over here. He passes the infection on to some of his peers. Um, we've lost many other babies along the way. And at some point in time, a human is in contact now because we've increased the contact and the frequency of contact between humans and animals and the density of both of our populations, a human might become infected. But usually these contacts don't actually arrive in infection. And if they do, the pathogen probably can't actually transmit between multiple humans. So time goes on and unless the mutation arises that actually now enables the pathogen to hop through other human, um, that basically we might actually see zoonotic transmission in those situations. So a lot of times we think about zoonotic diseases in terms of the risk that humans have from interacting with animals. However, a lot of times human pathogens can be passed on to both domestic and wild populations and have catastrophic impacts on them. So, an example or kind of a simulation of a disease spillover from a human to wild animals. Um, we start with our human adapted pathogen. Um, it proceeds through our human population and we have all this contact with these domestic animals because we live near them, we work with them on the landscape. Eventually one might opportunistically get sick but the pathogen has not yet evolved the means to transmit through that new host population. See more contacts, not that much occurring but now we get our mutation and now this pathogen can actually go through our new host population and cause potentially what could be an epidemic in the new host population. And something that is really important to think about is um, 
basically, now if we have very closely related wild counterparts on the landscape, these animals are more likely to be susceptible because of genetic similarity. And disease can actually spread now to wild populations from an original human source. Um, and I see a few things going on here. Okay, I'm not in trouble yet. Um, so one such example of a disease in anthro, um, an anthrozoonosis and camelids is actually sarcoptic mange. Um, mange is caused by a mite, uh, the same mite that gives rise to scabies in humans. And this mite has a very long evolutionary history with humans. Humans most likely brought the mite into the Americas during human migration, which then it is expected that they transmitted that mite to their domestic species and that this then from domestic species got transmitted to wild populations. Um, mange is very fatal in camelids and actually in like the 1500s, there are documented cases of it having resulted in the loss of 90% of all wild South American camelids. And these populations have never actually rebounded. So um, in conclusion, you know, uh, domestication very much so alters natural biodiversity. We engage in agricultural practices. We alter the landscapes of these animals that they live on. Um, we engage in unfortunately habitat destruction and even just creating kind of competition between domestic forms and wild forms. If you have to protect your domestic stock, it might come at the risk of sacrificing a wild population. Um, and coming back to this example, it's really critical that having highly diverse ecosystems actually inhibits um, disease transmission oftentimes in terms of like catastrophic ep epidemics that might otherwise occur in the situation that we saw with high host densities with a lot of contact. So that little rabbit dying right there is actually kind of a, it's a benefit that diverse ecosystems actually present to limit disease transmission. And we, we changed that during domestication. We actually removed a lot of biodiversity. We artificially increased populations um, and that actually puts it at a higher continuous risk for zoonotic disease. Um, another thing, because we have so many domesticates on the landscape now, it is our responsibility um, to make sure that we are monitoring the health and the welfare of those domesticates, not just you know, at face value, but because our wealth, our health and welfare is inextricable from that of theirs. And finally, um, it is biodiversity today, so we do have a responsibility to protect the remaining wildlife populations that we have through the development of more sustainable practices. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Kat. Um, and uh, and apologies to everyone. There was a little bit of a um, uh, mostly the the uh, Zoom bomb hacking was happening in the Q and A, but I have um, deleted uh, two hundred messages, so <laughs> we're down to the real ones now. Um, and uh, and so, do zoonotic diseases act as a selection pressure, selective pressure on domesticated animals, in addition to artificial human selection? Um. So that, that's a good question. I mean, I would say any type of infectious disease is absolutely a selectional pressure on whatever population it impacts. So when we get zoonotic diseases, it is really problematic when we see the potential of host crossing events. So if you are in proximity to a, another species that you're closely related to, or even that you have a ton of contact with, your risk of actually transmitting, and just through probability, right? Like probabilistic mutations, like having that pathogen mutate so that can now impact your species, it, it's really in the like the fitness mindset of the pathogen to be able to do that because now it has access to so many more species. So I would say that any sort of disease is absolutely um, and definitely zoonotic diseases, a, a selectional pressure. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question here. So I've got, uh, what a fantastic talk, Kat. You mentioned that the domestication of animals is also results in genetic and behavioral changes in their human counterparts. When you look at these changes in humans, do you see any changes in human morphologies that are related to the biomechanical demands of new behaviors resulting from new domestication events? This is quite an it involved uh, a question. So um, I, I think you might wanna just answer part of that and leave some of it for the ASCA ask an anthropologist at the at the end but uh, i think the um the short answer would be yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah from from the other from one of the many other archaeologists in the room the answer is yes and we can definitely get into more of those soon yeah and uh um yeah oh one last thing i think i'm just gonna quickly do before uh 
um, I introduce the next speaker, were the densities of camelids in early domestication significantly higher than the densities of the wild populations? Um, densities, densities, okay, of domestic camelids. So that's a great question. And because we don't actually have a very clean cut timeline as to when domestication um, first started versus when intensification of domestications like ended up happening occurred, it's actually very hard to determine that. What we do see on the landscape is we see from 9,000 years ago in Peru, um, we see mostly a subsistence strategy that were, um, depended on actually hunting deer. Um, and over time, the frequency of deer decreased relative to the amount of camelids we see in deposits. So it looks like people start hunting camelids more until we get to 6,000 years ago when there are so many camelids. And unfortunately, um, this is the tricky thing about these species. There are so many morphological, um, well, there's such morphological variability in the guanacos and in the vicuñas, and they have very large distributions that the variability between those species alone and when they overlap on one another does mask the variability in terms of early emerging llamas and alpacas. So unfortunately, this is a very hard question to figure out. Yes, <laughs> I absolutely agree with you, Kat, and thank you very much. Um, and we're going to move on to um, our last graduate student um, talk of today, and that's Erica Ebel. Um, and Erica actually works with me, so she is um, going to be t talking about work in Northwestern Greenland. All right, I'm just going to get my screen set up here. All right, can everyone hear me and see my full screen? Yes, we can. All right, this is great. Um, thank you, Kat, for that awesome presentation. I really liked your little animations in there. Um, I'm going to be talking about netting dovekies in northwestern Greenland. So we're going to go to a completely different part of the world for this presentation. Um, and just to give you an idea of how far north I'm talking, I have a little map here for you. So if you're joining us from Davis, California, you're down here in this green area. And the archaeological site of ETOT is in the northwestern portion of Greenland, and it's all the way up here where that red dot is. So ETOT is a really unique place to live um, because, as you can see from uh, these two photos here, it has a tundra and ice cap landscape. You'll probably notice that there's no trees there. Um, there's a dearth of uh, vegetation and it's mostly soil and rocks and ice. Uh, it's also a really unique place because it has an actual uh, relative abundance of animals. You might not think of the Arctic and think of biodiversity, um, but for the Arctic, this specific area actually has um, quite a few animals that migrate at least seasonally. And the one animal that I'm going to focus on today is the dove key. Um, and this is what they look like. They're a really small bird, a small seabird. They're, they weigh less than 200 grams and they can uh, quite literally fit in the palm of your hand. Um, and they've provided a stable and secure source of food for Inuit and pre-Inuit peoples of Northern Greenland for the last 1000 years. And they migrate into Northwestern Greenland, uh, actually in the millions, and they're there for about three months out of the year. Oh, and I'm so glad that Nisa talked about poop <laughs> because I'm also gonna talk about poop. Um, so one thing that you might be thinking of, if you have millions of birds uh, within the area, they're gonna poop a lot. They're gonna produce quite a lot of guano, um, especially when they're uh, flying from their nests and into the ocean to get their food. Um, they actually have quite a lot of droppings that fertilizes the surrounding area. And what this does is it acts like a fertilizer for other vegetation on the ground, um, which is great for animals like muskox, uh, which you can see in all of the grass and the vegetation that gets fertilized from the bird poop. And what that does is the influx of those grazers and those animals, muskox, uh, caribou, arctic hare, and arctic fox. Um, it also draws in humans because humans living in the arctic uh, need to eat. And so they often eat animal products. Um, again, I'll be focusing on dove keys today. 
uh, but just a little bit on the people who were living in this area of the Arctic. There's actually two different groups that occupied Utah uh, at slightly different times. The first group, they're, nor they're known as Late Dorset. We don't know too much about them, but what we do know is that they left some really beautiful archaeological materials behind, such as these uh, carvings made out of uh, antler, bone, and ivory. At the time that this group disappeared, um, a second group came in and occupied the site of Utah, and they came in around 1250 AD, um, and their descendants actually still live in northwestern Greenland today. Um, but I do want to mention that the site of Utah was abandoned in the tw early 20th century. All right, so now for the fun stuff, the actual netting of dove keys. Um, you might be wondering how people actually caught these tiny little birds. Um, and as you can see, here's a woman down here. She's holding up this really large net into the sky and you know, hoping that birds will fly into it. So if you're going to catch one of these birds uh, one at a time, probably doesn't seem very efficient, it might take a long time. But when you have a large net like this, you can actually capture you know, five um, up to 10 at a time. And so it kind of makes you know, bird catching worthwhile. And what these large nets are made out of is uh, pieces of narwhal ivory, um, small pieces of driftwood, because again, there's no trees in this environment. And so you have to use what you get. So they're lashing together small pieces of wood, ivory, antler um, to make that long pole. And for the actual net portion, it's pieces of seal skin kind of tied together to form the net. The net, excuse me. All right, so here's a close up of the net. You can see a bird actually caught in it. Um, and then on this left side, you can see uh, this woman, she's holding a pole. This one actually looks like it is made out of wood or something. But again, these actually are historic photos taken in 1913 to 1917. Um, and I wanted to also highlight in this photo uh, the rocky surroundings uh, where the people you know, wait out and <laughs> wait for the birds to fly by so they can raise their nets up and catch the birds. Um, the birds actually nest in those rocks. They'll lay their eggs right underneath. And so while one person is waiting for birds to fly by, you know, kids and, and all sorts of people can crawl around and actually collect eggs at the same time to get double the protein, <laughs> double the food. And so uh, people actually still have this kind of uh, hunting techniques. As you can see with the net here on the right, this is a modern net made out of modern materials, uh, but people are still using uh, basically the same type of net to hunt the dove keys. Uh, but I should say that this, these pictures are in Southern Greenland. Again, Utah was abandoned uh, in the early 20th century. So talking about Utah and all of the archaeological remains there. Um, Utah shows continuous occupation for about the last 1,000 years and serious exploitation of the dove keys that are roosting at that site. And so um, this might look familiar. It's an archaeological unit. So archaeologists, we dig square holes. Um, in this next photo, you're looking at the profile. So here's my mouse. Um, this second photo is actually the profile here, and this white little chalky bit is actually hundreds of small auk bones all together. So um, looking at that, you can tell people were really eating a lot of, a lot of dove keys. And this last photo here is, are those dove key bones kind of cleaned up and looking nice. These are actually complete dove key bones, um, and so they're really easy to identify even though they're super tiny. Uh, we have a scale here for you and you can tell that they're only about two centimeters long. So why would I be interested in looking at these tiny little bones? Well, we can use archeological materials and the ethnographic and historical materials to understand when, why, and how people were exploiting and using those tiny little birds. And that highlights the important role that they played in hunter-gatherer lifeways. Uh, the historic accounts from Arctic explorers in the region 
provide a good insight on how the small birds were captured and prepared. And have, uh, there's actually tons of different ways to prepare your dove key. Um, you can eat them, you know, just like any other bird, basically. Um, once they're caught, you could, you know, quickly skin them and uh, strip them of their meat. Um, you can eat them whole. However, uh, many dove keys were actually stored for the long Arctic winter. And so one notable product is known as kiviak, <laughs> which involves stuffing a seal skin with up to 500 or 600 of these little tiny birds into a seal skin. Um, and then you tie it up really tight, place it underneath a rock, and you let it ferment from anywhere between three and six months. And so what this does um, is it ferments the birds, um, kind of processes them, and the end result is described as a, hair, a highly aromatic food with a cheese-like consistency. Um, and this is actually a tradition that is still practiced today um, in Greenland. And that's why we have these two modern photos of it here. So we have our uh, dove keys here and being shoved into a seal skin. Uh, and you can tell that the birds are actually not processed. Um, the heads actually seem to be removed but all the feathers and bones and organs, they're left intact. And so the dove key remains that we're finding at Utah, they're not just uh, helping us understand archeology, span um, but it helps us to explore the nature of human environmental interactions over long periods of time. These birds seem to be linked with an increase in biodiversity and thus a change in ecology at the site. And this in turn has influenced human culture um, and how humans are adapting their technologies and their life ways to exploit those millions of dove keys. So hopefully everyone liked hearing <laughs> about dove keys as much as I like talking about them. Uh, they are really cute little birds. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, there is actually a, a question already. Do the indigenous people in Greenland have practices that help maintain and conserve uh, dove key populations? Oh, that is a good question. Um, not that I know of. And the reason would be because the dove keys are so numerous. Um, they're not an endangered species. Um, and there's several different rookeries throughout Northwestern Greenland. Um, in Northwestern Greenland alone, there's over there's like 30 million breeding dove keys. Um, and so it's definitely not an endangered species right now. Any other questions out there about tiny bird consumption <laughs> and, the, and the poop that they leave behind? <laughs> All right. Well, we will um, move on to, uh, it's me. Um, so I am your uh, your last speaker for today. And then we will have um, a general Q&A and get back to some of the questions that we put on hold in uh, in the Q&A room and, uh, and hopefully answer them then. So as you probably noticed, we're kind of, we're kind of bookending uh, the um, this speaker series, kind of talking more broadly about um, anthropology as a four field, four subfield discipline, um, something that it, that uh, includes archaeology, linguistics, cultural anthropology, and biological anthropology. And so we've we've heard from all of these various um, aspects of anthropology. And today I'm going to be um, talking to you a little bit about um, art in the Arctic and how that arc, art is translated into contemporary indigenous cultures in the Arctic today. Um, I will caveat that by saying, and it's probably pretty obvious that I am not uh, um, Inuit or indigenous. And so this is um, my perspective as an archeologist looking at this, but hopefully gives you a little, idea, a little bit of an idea of what it is that um, I can tell you about art prior to uh, Euro-American contact in the Arctic. So let me share my screen here. So I've called it the 
the spirit of the animals because realistically um, everything involved in uh, the Arctic region really has to do with the animals, um, where they go and the places you go to find them, uh, to quote um, an Inuit hunter. And so the spirits of the animals really play into all parts of Inuit life, um, particularly prior to missionization and um, contact. Hey, and yes. Um, we can see your notes uh, oh. slide. So if you go up to the display settings. Oh, sorry. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Um, I think that happened to you in uh, in one of the videos that we did um, earlier. So, <laughs> so, so thanks for catching that. Um, all right, so continuing on, what I wanted to, uh, I'm just gonna back up one slide here. What I wanted to do is give a, a quick shout out to um, a really amazing Inuit artist. Um, she's both uh, a, a Inuit dancer, um, as well as um, a visual artist. And you can uh, check her out at Jackie with a Q. Um, and uh, this is this kind of gives you an idea, though, of the variation in the style of dress across the contemporary Arctic today, which incorporates both kind of traditional clothing products, um, traditional hides and skins, as well as uh, introduced uh, Euro, Euro American or Western style clothing. So to situate you in the world, we're looking at the top of the globe in the circumpolar region. And so Inuit um, live in um, the upper regions of the globe here, where you are seeing the kind of blue area here, um, but also into this part of Russia as well. So Inuit mythology and art, I want to emphasize that these two things are intimately entwined. They are um, not something that you can separate as one thing is art, one thing is mythology, one thing is hunting. It is all part one and of the same. And Inuit myths are very complex. They are dramatic forms that are told orally, um, but they reinforce a fundamental part of Inuit culture that all nature has a spirit. Um, and the fundamental tenet here is that there are other worlds beneath the sea, inside the earth, and in the sky. And in fact, um, humans and all animals have what's known as an Inua, which is their spirit. And so that kind of emerges at, at birth, where it's part of the baby's first cry, and then that bubble bursts uh, at death. And so it becomes part of this cycle of life. They also have um, powerful angakok or shaman, and these shaman have the ability to journey into trances or dreams and journey to those other worlds in these trances. And these trances are sometimes um, induced with dancing and songs and drumming. Um, it's one of the reasons why drums were often something that was banned in Indigenous Arctic cultures because Christian missionaries thought that it kind of led to more of the shamanistic uh, practices. So storytellers um, would continue to model and remodel old uh, myths and create new myths as needed. And so um, taboos that would arise would often have to do with something that somebody had done that perhaps a, um, a new taboo would prevent those bad things from happening in the future. And the way that you evoked these different uh, um, spiritual and mythological aspects is through small carvings, through the production of drums and the playing of drums, through dances, through masks, through clothing, and in songs. And all of these things together kind of help pass on these oral traditions. And many of these traditions had um, a very strong practical aspect to them of things like don't go near the water's edge or the sea witch will get you or, um, you know, Pay attention to polar bears because they are both, uh, they can eat you, but they are also very powerful spirits. And so it was a way of kind of uh, realizing that you were part of nature. And this really kind of fits in with our Biodiversity Day theme today. 
<clears throat> so I wanted to show you uh, the very first time that I went to the Arctic and we excavated uh, on a place called Little Cornwallis Island, which is in the central Canadian high Arctic in what is now Nunavut. And we found a number of really interesting carvings there, many different polar bears of very different, various different shapes and sizes, where you have um, polar bears that are swimming, um, some that are, and this is one I, I found, um, some that have uh, polar bears going in two different directions. And this one has a little hole in the middle. It probably was worn as a pendant. Lots of um, swimming bears, very stylized. Some are on four legs. Um, some of them have these kind of skeletal motifs. And then some are actually transforming. This is kind of an interesting one that's transforming from a bear into a human or a human into a bear. Um, and we also have this kind of interesting combination up at the top corner here, you can see um, where we have a sculpin and these very stylized uh, polar bears that are kind of swimming. And if you're thinking they may look a little bit like a harpoon, they do. Um, and there are harpoons that are also stylized as swimming bears to potentially get the, um, the, the kind of hunting prowess of the bear invoked into the hunting implement. And a really interesting one that we found here is a kind of a combination of a diving seal uh, with two walrus on either side. This is carved out of walrus ivory and then a human face on it, which is interpreted based on our ethnographic knowledge of the of the region as being probably a shaman's tube for kind of, again, evoking those spirits. Um, and then you may have seen a, a preview in Erica's presentation where we see the um, these carvings here and I wanted to show you those previous carvings and so um, we found those previous carvings in 1994 and now you go from the central Canadian Arctic across about 400 kilometers to northwestern Greenland and you find four carvings that are almost identical that and these ones were found in 2016. And so um, the project that I started on and our most recent time in Greenland, we found an identical set of carvings um, with the sculpin and three stylized bears um, found placed together and we're not exactly sure what this means, but clearly there was some sort of connection in terms of the way that, that um, folks in this region thought about uh, the animal world and the spirits of those animals. Uh, my other little favorite carving uh, from Northwest Greenland is this little guy that's waving hello. Um, but I also want to point out that carvings again are um, part of the whole of their lifestyle. So they are decorating combs, they're decorating hairpins, they have these elaborately carved um, fish lures. And so carvings are not something that is um, new as far as talking about contemporary Inuit art, just that they are taking a different form. Um, Inuit in the late 19th and early 20th century were carving little figurines out of ivory for um, outsiders, so polar explorers coming to the Arctic as a way to trade or exchange for other goods um, that they may be interested in. So this was kind of the first sale, you might say, of, um, of artwork in the Arctic to outsiders or tourists. And so this is something that has continued, but what was added was not just the carving of stone or bone or antler, but printmaking. And so there was an artist named James Houston who came to the Canadian Arctic in the late 1940s and um, adapted Japanese printmaking techniques for the North. Um, and the federal government thought that this might be a way to drive um, economic development in the Canadian Arctic um, because there, the opportunities in a lot of these um, villages, particularly as they've been forced by the Canadian government to settle into villages, was very difficult. Um, so these Inuit owned cooperatives were set up and probably the most famous of these artists was Knuyuak Ashavak, who um, her enchanted owl, which is this one here, is the, probably the most famous image from Canada. It's found on our postage stamps and you can buy them on mugs and, and all over the place. And so she, um, she kind of evokes what we might call more of the kind of traditional style of, of 
of contemporary Inuit art, along with some of the, the art materials that we have in our museum. So I encourage you to go visit the Anthropology Museum's webpage, and you can visit um, a number of different collections from around the world that we have in our museum and uh, in kind of virtual world. And you can see both the carvings here um, made out of soapstone, as well as out of um, antler. So it's a, a, a crane uh, made out of antler. And this is Sedna, who was uh, the sea witch who kind of gave rise to sea mammals in Inuit mythology. And I wanted to also give a little bit of a shout out to Down the Road. Um, you can go online to the de Young Museum um, until it's open to the public again and take a look at some of the Inuit art that they have as well. Um, so David Rubin um, Piktukun uh, undertook this kind of bear man shamanic transformation. And I put it up here because it evokes what you see in some of the prehistoric or pre-contact art that you find in the Canadian Arctic. And as he says, in our culture, we have such a thing called spirit helpers. With the introduction of modern religion, he means Christianity, the shaman slowly disappeared, but they live through the artist in this day and age as we are extensions of that. Um, and so there's a lot of change going on in the Arctic right now, um, and that is particularly salient with respect to climate change. And um, there's a word that they use called to behave strangely. And the Arctic is experiencing climate change like no other place on the planet. Um, but what I want to leave you with is the artistic elements because it actually is kind of a, a bit of a, a positive note to leave things on. And it is really women in the Arctic kind of leading the way here in maintaining uh, traditions in terms of clothing styles, dance. Um, there's been a revival of traditional tattooing. So this is an image from an archaeological find that dates to almost 4,000 years ago. And here you see women's hands and also tattooing of faces um, within the past 10 years has become revitalized across the Arctic um, from Alaska to Greenland. And I also wanted to point out uh, two uh, amazing Inuit women who one who was uh, has been and continues to be a champion for um, the Arctic environment with her book The Right to be Cold. She was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for her work, um, bringing uh, the attention of the Arctic to the world stage. Um, and Tanya Tagak, my students last quarter uh, read her book, Split Tooth. She is both a performative artist as well as an author that really kind of tells the story of Inuit life and the impacts of residential schools or boarding schools and how this art is a way of kind of maintaining that connection with your um, ancestors. So thank you all very much. And, um, we will shift on to the Ask an Anthropologist stage where we can go back to some of the Q&As that are uh, in our, our Q&A session. And uh, I will stop sharing right there and invite all of the, the, the um, uh, presenters to turn their videos back on. So that was, uh, we're ending with a little bit of kind of cultural anthropology meets biodiversity and climate change after kind of starting at the beginning with uh, um, human ecology and, uh, and animal ecology here in California. So um, I'm going to, uh, oh, there's actually, there was a question here that I think I missed for Erica. I think it came just as I was starting. So Erica, I'm gonna um, uh, pass this on to you. It said, when eating kiviak, were the bones and feathers also eaten? And do they ferment into a cheese as well? And does this complete bird consumption and or fermentation add nutritional um, or periodic benefits? Yeah, these are all great questions. Um, when you eat kiviak, uh, you actually discard the feathers once you pull them back out of that seal package. Um, and I guess they, they're somewhat easy to remove, um, but you do actually eat the bones. So I'm not sure if the bones become cheese-like or mushy. Um, they do. Uh, they do, okay. So yeah, I've heard <laughs> it described as like a spreadable uh, <laughs> yeah. texture. I've never eaten kibiyak myself. <laughs> 
Um, so you do eat the bones and everything except for the feathers, um, the beak and the feet. Um, about probiotics, I'm not really sure. I'm assuming there's probably some kind of benefit because it's fermented, um, but those benefits probably don't outweigh the, the risk of botulism or, you know, getting infected from eating, uh, you know, birds that were fermented for six months. <laughs> oh, interesting, an interesting study done by um, an anthropologist at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, is mm -hmm. they looked at um, the fermentation of um, seal oil in the Yupik region of Alaska and found that as they shifted away from using skin bags to ferment the oil to um, five gallon plastic buckets, not only um, were the buckets off gassing uh, um, BPAs, but it also led to higher incidence of botulism. And so what they've been trying to do is get folks to return back to kind of traditional methods for fermenting rather than um, the, uh, the plastic buckets. Um, but plastic buckets are very popular in the villages that we work in in the Arctic. Um, and so after we were done excavating, um, all our buckets were claimed up pretty quickly by, by um, the folks in the, in the villages that I've worked in. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, are there any differences in the form or type of art that mark different Inuit groups? Healer up variations in beliefs between groups. Um, well, I won't attempt to uh, to determine people's belief systems in the past, that's really difficult. Um, but we do see artistic elements that are quite different um, when you go across the entire circumpolar region. Um, so even if you look from the uh, Bering Strait region of Russia and Alaska, and then compare that to what you find in Canada and Greenland, there is quite a difference in terms of the, of the style of the art, um, in terms of the types of little dots and circles and things that, that are used. Um, what's in the Bering Strait um, is said to have more kind of artistic connections to kind of um, to China, to Mongolia and those regions, um, but they're, they're also very kind of universal in some ways, dots, circles, lines um, that we find um, virtually everywhere, um, as my paleoanthropology colleagues could tell you. Um, and then uh, we're going to come back to uh, one of the questions that was for uh, for Yelmer Erkins. And it's, I've read recently about really large mule deer migrations in Wyoming on the order of hundreds of kilometers. Have you examined the scale of mule deer migrations archaeologically yet? Uh, <coughs> did Thank Randy, you, Randy ask this question? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't. I haven't investigated um, anything like that. Well, maybe maybe we need to do that. That uh, Yelmer. <laughs> yes, um, that certainly certainly could be do that. It could be done. That sounds like a good um, dissertation project yep. for someone. <laughs> Okay, um, and then uh, Neetha, there are a couple of questions here for you. Actually, there's three questions here for you. You're very popular. Um, do uh, the gorilla get parasites from their mothers or only from the environment? This is the first one. That's an excellent question. Um, so it depends on the disease agent, on the parasite. Some parasites are transmitted vertically from mother to infant. The ones that I study, gastrointestinal nematodes, um, are generally acquired from the soil or the environment. So there's soil transmitted. Um, there are a couple of species or groups of um, um, parasites that are nematodes that are actually potentially transmitted by a direct interaction. So if you're like grooming someone and you pick up a nematode, and there's a couple of cases in the literature that suggest that transmammary um, uh, transmission is possible. They're just, it's very rare. So they've documented this in, in some dogs and um, not there, there aren't any cases that are reported in wild primates at the moment, but it's possible there, you know, there's, there's a lot to, to be done there with them, um, with that kind of research. But most, most of the, the parasites that I study are transmitted from the environment. Um, and and Nathan, I, um, I think this is from one of your family members. Uh, can you determine the lifespan based on the dung analysis? And if yet, if yes, what is the trend up or down? Yeah, Maya and I were talking about how 
you know, it's a rare opportunity for our family to be able to to zoom in since they don't live in the United States. Um, so this was they, they both all our family stayed up. Um, I, I'm not so I, I'm as unclear if it was talking about the lifespan of the gorilla or the the parasite. So you can determine the age of a gorilla or the uh, relative age of a gorilla based on the dung size. So that's actually sometimes what we do with dung that we find in the environment that we, you know, we don't know who actually deposited that, that dung. Um, but if it was referring to parasites, um, parasites have different life stages um, and nematodes, you know, transition between these different life uh, stages in the environment. So at some point, you know, when they're at this larval stage of development that's infective, um, that's when they you can you can infect, or that that's when those parasites can infect the gorilla. So you can determine based on these um, divisions and the stage of the the parasite, you know, um, the, the lifespan or the 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 age of the the parasite or relative age of the parasite. I'm not sure if that was what the question was getting at, but I hope that that answered it. Um, and. Um... So Dr. Erkins wanted to ask Erica uh, a question, but was having, wasn't able to get it to load into the Q&A. But I, I think you may have answered this. Have you tried Kivyak? No, I haven't tried it. Um, I've watched YouTube videos of people eating it. I've read uh, you know, historic documents describing it. Um, it sounds very um, aromatic. <laughs> um, I feel like I need to try it because I research it, but you know, I'm a little so, uh, so um, my co-PI in, in the Arctic is Jenny Lemoyne, who is uh, the curator of the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum at Bowdoin College, and she has eaten kivyak, and, uh, um, and so um, her comment is it tasted a lot like kind of like a, a Stilton or a really strong blue cheese. So, and it, yes, it was kind of spreadable. So. That's a good description. <laughs> so, um, Mayawa. Uh, you talked about what we can learn about birth from the Neanderthal pelvic reconstructions. What are some of the other things we can learn about from that specific bone? Oh, well, for one thing, we're actually, um, we could learn a lot about gait. We could learn a lot about posture, for example. So one of the things that changed in the reconstruction from the sort of original fossil as is, is that we found out that the sacrum, which is that part at the back, I actually have my model here. We found out that this was pushed forward a little bit more. So if you look at it, the cavity, this was a little more upward and now it's been pushed down. And that's something that is actually seen um, in modern humans. We have a pretty um, forward oriented pelvis, which affects the way our vertebral column actually arranges behind there. So what it looks like is some of these traits are becoming, some of the traits that I looked at um, actually seem to have a slightly, not, with, not necessarily a modern human, but as far as the reconstruction and the original, the reconstruction moves some of those features a little bit closer to the modern configuration, um, which is probably showing that there's a lot more variation in Neanderthal pelvic structure than we thought. Also, Neanderthals lived for a very long time, so you might also have a time differential in some of those features. You might also have a geographic differential in those features. Um, but from this, it'll be interesting because some, there recently actually just been a reconstruction of the vertebral column, as well as the ribs. So it'll be nice to actually work with those researchers to build Kabara again together and see what all those other reconstructed bits can um, tell us about its posture. So we think it would have had maybe, I mean, Yantel posture would still have been different from ours, but we can definitely learn a little bit more about how they moved about. Um, and there's another one here for you, Nitha. Um, how do you overcome the challenges of gathering fecal matter and knowing which gorilla the poop is from? Another excellent question. Um, it is challenging sometimes, especially because I, I think a lot of the pictures I showed were of gorillas on the ground, but gorillas actually spend a considerable amount of time in the trees. So when they um, defecate in the trees or if they have nest sites or nests that are up in the trees, um, gorillas build nests every night. Um, it's hard to reach those, those fecal samples or, I, you know, uh, it's hard for me to, to gather that, that dung. Um, but what you do is you sample multiple days in a row if you're sampling a specific group. Um, and then I think the, the second half was, uh, I forget what the, the second part of that question was. 
sorry, I will find that. Um, how do you get over kind of the, I think the, 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 the challenge of knowing which one it came from, particularly mm. Camilla? Yeah, that, that's also a great question. I think, you know, it's something that uh, anthropologists and even Maya has um, had to deal with this if she's dealing with, you know, um, DNA from a sample that's really old. Um, fecal material doesn't preserve DNA very well, but you can extract um, gorilla DNA from the fecal sample. And so we send our samples to a collaborator in um, Sweden and she's able to extract like the minimal amounts of cellular DNA from, um, from that fecal material so that we can identify um, which gorilla uh, deposited that sample? Well, there are um, no other questions in the chat. So, um, does anyone else have any further questions? Well, uh, otherwise, we will um, stop our recording and uh, um, end our time with you today. So, thank you all for joining us. Um, again, sorry about our uh, little minor uh, Zoom bot glitch uh, hack there, but. Um, you know, hey, that's what happens when you're live. And uh, if we were in person, we would have had other issues like small children touching things that they're not supposed to or something. <laughs> so so there, there's challenges either way. Um, so so again, thank you everyone for, for joining us and thank you so much to the panelists for, um, for um, offering up your research and your knowledge and, um, and hopefully we will get to do this again with everyone uh, in, in live in person next year. Um, and when you can all try to, uh, to throw an atlatl um, on, on the lawn at uh, near Young Hall or Corey will teach you how to make a stone tool yourself. So, so again, thank you all very much and I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>